Welcome everybody to Troubadour Talks. Today we're going to be having a conversation about the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Not just his life, but also the book that he wrote, the autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Um, and I have with me Jesse McCarthy from MontessoriEducation.com. Now, I wanted to say thank you, uh, Jesse, for reminding me of this book. This is one of those books or this this series that I think pretty much everybody in America, every you know public school kid, read at least some packet of it. I don't know if you remember those packets we used to get in yeah. school. And I know that like you know we used to every spring you had to throw away all the stuff. I know that some of those packets you know, one of them or, you know, throughout whether it's history or literature class, we got a packet of at least a portion of this work from Frederick huh. Douglass. It was one of those things. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that is the case. And and I know what you're saying, because you'd get this little clip or this excerpt yeah. within your book. And it, it, unfortunately, that's sad, given Frederick Douglass is yeah. just brilliant in the way he describes things. But yeah. yeah, no, we should read the whole thing. It should have been something that we read the whole book. But I want to yeah. say thank you for, um, you know, reminding me to read this again, because I hadn't read anything like you know, or read Frederick Douglass since, um, you know, my K through 12 ed education, yeah, uh, quote wow. unquote education. Um, yeah. So before we go into the story of this narrative, why it exists, why Frederick Douglass wrote it, what it's about, uh, if you could just real quickly tell us a little bit about yourself and Montessori education mm -hmm. and what you're doing over there, and then we'll hop into it so people know who you are. Yeah, sure. So I started uh, as a just a relatively traditional school teacher, fourth through eighth grade. Um, I say relatively because I think we were doing some unique stuff uh, in in content and how we were teaching. But generally speaking, it was children in desks. I was up at the front teaching. Uh, had a had a blast. But over time, realized you know there's this Montessori classroom down the hall. And Kirk, you were at the school at some point. We were colleagues back then. But down the hall, there was like this three to six year old classroom, and I'd go sit in there and start to see wow, these like three and four and five year olds are more independent than like 13, 14 year olds in the class. Mm. And I was like, well, some, something's not right. And I, not to dis discredit the 13, 14 year olds, a lot of them were more independent than I was in my early twenties. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah. so I started to kind of get more and more interested in Montessori and then, you know, eventually got trained, became a head of school, learned a lot more about, ch learned a lot more about children, what drives them, what drives us as adults, uh, eventually helped to kind of build a bunch of Montessori schools where I was originally teaching. And then uh, I jumped off and did my own thing, MontessoriEducation.com, where I speak and write um, and help schools really uh, to develop themselves in Montessori. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to go into a full on song and dance about Montessori, but uh, yeah, I work at MontessoriEducation.com and you can learn a bunch there. So why well, uh, just so every, you know, just so you know, I don't know if I told you this before, but a lot of the people that go to Troubadour are educators or um, stay at home mm. moms or dads. Like that's a lot of the people that, um, you know, like I'm doing the Literary Canon Club and we have three parents, two stay at home moms in the, the first group of eight awesome. that we're doing. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we I, I, you know, like working with those individuals. Um, you know, this is a big thing that we're doing at Troubadour. And that's, you know, maybe leads us into uh, the life of Frederick Douglass and so this idea of educating and being independent and being a, a self-made man, which is a term he does use. I don't think he uses it in this work. But he uses yeah. it in other books that he's written and other speeches he's written. But um, before we, you know, I wanted to ask why you chose this book and why it's important to you. But before we do that, I'd like to give everybody um, a kind of overview of the story. It's actually not a long book. I mean, just so mm -hmm. people, if you are watching this, it's pretty thin in the version I have. Uh, if yeah. you're listening to this, I think it's like this version is like 50 pages. Now, the pages are pretty big. Um, so it's a lot of text, but it's not, it's really not that long. It takes like, you know, two hours, two and a half hours to read, I think. You yeah. Know, I, think I, it's a, I mean, I think practically it's an easy read, Yeah. but it's a, it's a hard read emotionally, but it's a yeah. very easy read in that, in that sense. Which right I think now. is probably something he was doing on purpose, right? He was trying yeah. to, you know, can he, he wanted to reach a lot of people of varying, um, literate, literate degree. And so he has very powerful, good writing, but it's also accessible to many different literacy levels, I think. And that's one mm -hmm. power of it. But what is, so this, what's the story we're going into? I mean, it's, cause it's not his entire life. Of course there it's, it's not every moment of his birth to his death. He's writing it in 1845. And, I, and so it's before slavery has been abolished. It's before the civil war. 
Um, and it he and he actually lives on until what 1890, I believe he passes away. Long life. Yeah, he li- he lives a long, fruitful life, and he was born a slave. And then, um, so the story is essentially the story of the or the narrative is essentially, if, if I were to essentialize it, it would be him being born into this world of slavery and the the key moments that led to his essential his escape. And, you know, into the north. And he doesn't talk a lot about the, the Underground Railroad at this point, which I think is really important. In fact, in the, the story, he actually kind of says that it's not a big deal, which I thought was yeah. interesting. Like, because we find out that later in life that it was a big deal to some degree that he was a part of it. And I think it's because he was trying to, uh, th- this goes to the nature of the story, that it was, he was trying to really engender the movement of abolition and he thought of it as a tactical thing and that's what i think is part of the interesting in reading this is, is a, as a historical document is like not only as a piece of great literature but it's a it's this is him trying to really inspire people to take actual action to uplift uh black slaves at this time and to you know do what's necessary to engender a movement yeah and what what i would say is so I mean, I taught history for years to fourth or eighth graders. So I'm always very careful just because of how much I realized I was super ignorant and I'd go, oh yeah, I think I know this. And then you start to research independently and you realize, wow, I, I don't know anything, mm-hmm. you know, that type of thing. Um, ov- obviously when you start to really research things, you get begin to really know something. So it, you know, that I don't know anything disappears, but I'm raising that because with Frederick Douglass, I don't, I'm not in any way an expert on the history of mm-hmm. Frederick Douglass. I know that he wrote different versions of this as time went by. So, you know, to think of Frederick Douglass at this time when he first wrote this versus the, you know, the more mature Frederick Douglass, which is he might be much more purposeful, deliberate in the beginning. He's, you know, he's writing his life. So, you know, I don't want to get into or I'd be careful about getting into like exactly historically what he was trying to accomplish and so forth. Oh, but yeah. um, I would say I would say that you're kind of a summary of it this man born into slavery. And it's kind of like, here is my rise out of the hellish uh, world of slavery. But I, but I think you're right. He wants to show you just how hellish it is so that you make change, whether you're, you know, a slave, whether you're a slave owner, whether you're a slave yourself, or whether you're just some random person just living your life, not thinking about these things. So he wanted to reach everybody. And with the message of, yeah, this needs to end. This is barbaric. It's inhuman. So, yeah. And he, he didn't, um, he didn't pull back his punches in terms of the language that he uses. Yeah. For instance, one of the moments that's one of the many moments that stuck out to me was the, the moment where he goes to, um, I, I don't remember exactly where it's his the location is, but he goes to a new family that owns him when he's a slave. Yeah. The and Alds. is it the Alds where they're a little bit nicer, right? He yeah, talks the, about the, well, the wife is, the nicer, wife is yeah. a little bit nicer um, and it struck me as, as how he wrote this of, um, and I don't remember the exact quote, but is essentially the corrupting power of owning slaves. And it reminded me of the Socrates quote or the Socrates idea uh, or question, is it worse to um, have an evil deed done to you or is it worse to do an evil deed? And I think it's, you know, if we don't stop to think about it, it's obvious that it's worse to have it done to you. That's what most, I think, that's what a lot of people would say. Um, obviously, I don't want to be whipped like Frederick Douglass was whipped. That's horrific and that's an evil that's done to him. Let's stop thinking. But I think what Frederick Douglass does in this narrative and what uh, is worth thinking about is the evil it does to the individual doing the whipping. So this mm-hmm. is this is a corrupting influence of the soul, not only of um, the black slaves in this case, but also of the white slave owners. And so it's good for nobody. There's no amount of good in it. And it's evil at its core, not just because, again, it's obviously evil um, to to harm another individual. And I'm happy you're raising that because I think today in our culture, for sure, there's this sense that, oh, these these um, these people that are oppressing others, they're getting away with things and they're living these amazing lives while other people are being oppressed. And I think you're right to highlight this. And that's one of the reasons why Frederick Douglass is such a hero and has been a hero of mine is that he shows the dehumanizing element of slavery for every human being. 
So he and and I think you're completely right. And with Miss Ald there, I mean, it's it's horrific because he finally finds he says something like this. You know, I finally found a white woman that was just different. She was like this angelic being. And then, as you say, slavery corrupts her to the point when she becomes this hard hardened like soul like this. How he described I forgot the wording he, he uses, but she becomes like a devil. Yeah. Um, and and she was a beautiful caring human being before slavery corrupted her. So, um, but yeah, I think, and I think you're right to say, listen, it, it turns people bad. It corrupts everyone, but to be a slave, to be whipped, to be as Douglas describes here, literally shot point blank in the head. That's a lot different than, you know, me having to deal with slavery in my society. And it's kind of, Oh, I have to see this bad stuff. In reality, it's worse to be a slave than to be a random person who happens to be living during the time of slavery. That's that's my personal view. Mm-hmm. Um, but it cr- but it does corrupt everyone in, in that way. So, yeah, I think the purpose of the question is to make you just stop and think about it, not necessarily to agree that it's worse to yeah. be the slave owner in that sense. Um, I actually found the the moment I think you're talking about with her changing um, this kind hard had but a short time to remain such. The fatal poison of irresponsible power was already in her hands and soon commenced its infernal work. That cheerful eye under the influence of slavery soon became red with rage. Yeah. I was like, and that voice made all the, of sweet accord change to one of harsh and horrid discord. And that angelic face gave place to that of a demon. And, yeah. you know, the, it's, it's beautiful language. I just want people yeah. to kind of get a sense of the language it's not, you know, he's because, and, and this is just one moment he taught, he doesn't just state this as like, okay, she became a evil and that's it. He does describe, and this is one of the values, the literary values. He describes the transition of how she was very helpful and the, how she taught him a B his ABCs. Uh, she was the one who taught him his ABCs, uh, which we could talk about in a minute about how, you know, what that did for him as a human, as a man. But then um, when he seen when her husband started pointing out things like, hey, doing that is a really bad idea because it gives the slave the thought or it gives the slaves thoughts, basically, and that they can then become free and they'll become belligerent and they won't answer your orders because there is something. And this is one of the, the evils, again, of the slave owner side as well, or the whole system, I should say, is that. People recognized that the critical thing to do with slavery and owning slaves was you had to keep the slaves down. Mm-hmm. Like you had to. And this is true of all slave societies, I think, to some degree is, you know, the slave, slaves have existed for all of time, but there's always been, you know, you have to keep the slaves down. Otherwise, there's going to be a revolt, right? You're going to have the it, once they realize that they can bind together, that there's like, you know, seven of them for one of you. Um, once they start realizing that and they start coming together and they organize, it's all over. And I think yeah. every slave society kind of understands that and it's built into their structure and it's kind of in their code, in their culture. And you see that in the narrative of Frederick Douglass. And it's an important lesson for us to learn today, a historical lesson that we forget because we're now removed from slavery by 150 years. And I think we simplify the whole thing too much. Yeah. So two things jump out. One, just a very practical note is one of the reasons I said, you know, you were asking me, hey, do you want to come on and do a book? And, you know, we were joking around because Kurt gave me all of these different books. And then I'm like, well, let's do this one. And it was none of the ones that Kurt was on Kurt's list. But I I didn't just chose, choose it because I love Frederick Douglass. Like Anne Frank's another hero of mine. Um, and I didn't choose her work. I choose, chose Frederick Douglass because he does have a poetic sense about how he writes. That's what I thought. Mm-hmm. So I thought this is fitting for you because you like to focus on poetry and, and you know, how people communicate. And because I think there are people today, even like Thomas Sowell, Sowell comes to mind that very logical, very rational. He's he's kind of intense, too. But Frederick Douglass takes the argument and makes it so vivid that it's hard. Like, what do you do? Like, how do you argue with Frederick Douglass when he's showing you so vividly what's happening in the real world? It's just it's so powerful. So anyways, I just want to note that because I agree with you, the power of that. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you about this one. Um, and then the other thing is this power of learning to uplift human beings. And mm. 
you know, as you said, throughout history, you you cannot allow s any type of slave or any person you're holding down to get a hold of learning because it will eventually change things and want them to rise. And I think just to think about today, you see that through all movements, whether it's like a communist party or a super religious sect that does, there's no Q and A period at a communist party meeting, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I never thought you know, about that. There's no Q and A in today's, you know, hardcore, like we, you know, anti-racism. I can't go in there and start questioning the actual things that they're saying. I can't be curious. So I think there's some similarities in thinking about movements that don't allow you to question their fundamental views. Um, yeah. So, so I think there's something similar going on. Now, obviously it's not the same as like the exact same as a slaveholder, not allowing you to literally forcing you to do something. But I tend to, to enjoy movements, even if I disagree with them, where they allow you to question everything. Kind of like Socrates, question everything. Um, or X-Files, if you want to put it more in the mind. <laughs> you know, the truth, <laughs> the is, truth out there. is out there, man, it is. <laughs> and you gotta so, question everything, even if, if yeah. aliens exist. Uh, although he was pretty, I have to, this is a side note, I guess, but uh, Mulder was a little bit spiritual in his belief. Yeah. Like I, he didn't have that. I know, I know you're joking, but I'm just yeah, saying, yeah, I know. Um, but Mulder was looking, looking for a sister that got like kidnapped by crazy aliens. Yeah. I, yeah, I love know, these that analogies, show. Yeah. These analogies only go so far, oh, but yeah, yeah. X-Files yeah. was uh, something special for me when I was younger. So, um, so that, that's trying to bring it back to what you were just saying. So I, I think the, the, you know, you, you, you harped on this twice that it's a um, more challenging to say, you know, or slavery itself is, of course, an evil. Just being owned by another person is a whole evil. And I would just, I guess, also, and then you made the connection between there's certain movements today where there is um, not the evil of slavery, where they're owning people, but there is the evil of uh, at least the the focus on shutting people down, not thinking, you know, a, a white man like myself, you know, that's how they would categorize me. I don't categorize myself as a white man. I'm, you know, a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and, and I could consider myself an American, but I couldn't ask questions. I couldn't even talk about stuff like Frederick. Douglass. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine me going to um, a conference today, even or a college campus and giving a lecture on the life of Frederick Douglass oh, because yeah. I wouldn't be allowed to because I'm white, which is such a bizarre thing because I, when I read this, I see this as such a critical story in the American corpus, right? Like mm -hmm. I've taken courses on classics of American literature, right? And a lot of times they'll start with something like um, uh, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin actually. And, mm -hmm. and like how, what, what he did and, and writing and, the the you know move on to like Washington Irving, um, and you, you'll hear stories from him and, and so on and so forth. And I think this narrative is part of that American culture, and it's something that what what Frederick Douglass was teaching us and what he's showing everybody of all colors in here is the story of um, slavery to freedom, and and not even just the literal slavery that he went through, but just even metaphorically any kind of enslavement to the ideas of other people, to the, the, the uh, inclinations of other people, the pressure mm -hmm. from other people into independence. And, and that story is a critical one for all of us to learn. And, and he, um, you know, there's a, there's a moment in here, which is almost um, biblical. And he has, when you were talking about like the language thing mm -hmm. and, and how he, part of it is his rhetoric, rhetorical style is very morally, infused with a biblical language like the demonic oh, yeah. face poison you know it's 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 not like which isn't literally true it's not like she literally ha you know it's it's very metaphorical and powerful yeah. language which i love it's great because it makes it his view point uh very powerful but there's a moment where he talks about um he is attacked or no excuse me he is working out i think in the field somewhere and he has um like heat stroke or something and he he basically mm -hmm. he's like vomiting and, and falling down to his knees and the slave that the slave owner the overseer that he's at is a person that i think it's old and you'll have to remind me um but one of his slave owners 
passed him on to in order to train him better, in order to break him mm. down, specifically to break him down. That's what this particular overseer is good at. You know, if you think about like, you know, this is a breaking of, of animals. I mean, that's what this guy was trying to do is, is not break an animal, but turn them into an animal, I think is what mm -hmm. he was trying to do by beating them randomly you know, for no pur purpose, sometimes because it was no purpose, right? Like it's, he talks about that. So Frederick Douglass is collapsed. You know, he's been overworked for days. He has a, a headache. He's vomiting. And the overseer cracks him in the head, right? And he, and he hits him. And then uh, Frederick D Douglass walks to his, he somehow makes it two miles to his actual slave owner and begs him to help him. Mm -hmm. Begs him to get him out of this. Like says, this is, I can't handle this anymore. You're going to lose me because I'm going to die. And the, the slave owner sends him back. When he goes back, and I think this is like a critical moment for in, in the mind of Frederick Douglass, at least in this narrative, this version of the narrative, he fights the overseer, physically fights him. And they fight to a stalemate. And that's when he realizes, that that's like when it really pivots in his mind, you must take control of your own life. You cannot go to your master. You cannot go to your friend. Nobody can do it for you. You have to fight your own fight. You have to go out there and earn your own freedom. No one mm -hmm. will do it for you. And that to me was just such a powerful literary moment. Yeah. And I, I mean, I agree. And I, the, the main reason Frederick Douglass is so powerful to me is actually not about slavery. It's about being a self-made human being. So taking control of your own life and taking it in your own hands. And it just happens to be that he literally did it. Like most of us will never have to create ourselves to the extent that Frederick Douglass did. He was raised, basically taught from birth that you're nothing, that you should stay on the ground. You should stay with your face in the ground and do what I tell you. And this man not only intellectually had to realize that, you know, that's not me, but physically had to rise up and fight people off. So I'm with you. And I think that moment is pivotal for him because it's like, we can understand these things intellectually. It's kind of like this, you know, when you're sitting there go, oh, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to do this. And then you wake up tomorrow mm -hmm. and you're like, just lying in bed going, ah, maybe I won't. Mm -hmm. Like it's intellectual when you're like, oh, I should be a better person. It, Frederick Douglass didn't have the choice. It was like, either you're going to be a better person and rise up, or you can just BS yourself all day long and just remain uh, a nothing. So he took his life and said, it's mine. Um, I know he had help along the way in different ways, but at a core level, this was his fight. You know, so I think um, you'll even see, which one thing I love about Frederick Douglass is, and you're you're hitting at this by saying this is br almost broader than slavery, is that he doesn't just put down his slave owners. He puts down, he, he shows that some of the, the, the Africans that were slaves were holding each other down. Yeah. And it's just a That's part a good... of the whole system. So at some point you need to say, I'm not going to be a part of this system. I'm going to change my own life first. You know, then that's, yeah. that's another thing. It's, it's my life. He didn't, you know, Frederick Douglass didn't say, I'm going to fight this guy off because I want to end slavery. No, I'm, like, I'm going to fight this guy off because I don't want my life like this. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, I think that is one fundamental with him too, is that today everybody wants to save the world. And then you look at their own lives and it's a big mess. You know, it's like, I don't want to be around this person. They're, they're a mean person. They're an angry person, but they're going to save the world for us. Yeah. You know, like, so Frederick Douglass says I, he, I, in the first part, it's not about ending slavery. It's about, I don't want this anymore. You know? So anyhow. Mm -hmm. that well, and you have to come to that yourself as part of what each slave has to come to it. And I think what he's railing against in this narrative, now I haven't read a lot of his other works, so I don't know other things. I, I've I've um, listened to some courses or some lectures about him, um, but I you know not, I want to read some of his other things because he wrote a lot about self made. I I did read um, I don't know if you've read this. What is you know the the Fourth of July to the the yeah, slave? That's intense. Right? That's an intense yeah. that every that should be required reading for every K through twelve Wonderful. student. Like yeah, it's so. So good, and it gets to the spirit of what America really is, right? What the, the essence of it in his view is, and, and you know, how, why you should fight. Like, I, I did read something about his, he gave nine reasons apparently for why 
the black slave should fight in the civil war or why the black man should. And he, none of them were because of a duty to the country. Cause he says, you don't have no duty to this country. This country has done nothing for you, but he gives these reasons like, you know, it'll build your self esteem for yourself. You'll be fighting for the thing that you do want one day, you know, things, I don't remember all nine of them, but that those kinds of ideas. And I think that's just such an important lesson for, um, all of us to say, and then you 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 were mentioning the other slaves bringing each other down. What this really, what this whole thing really makes me think of is what he's really fighting, and it's represented by this overseer, but it's represented by every moment of this, and why literature, speaking, ideas, education, you know, another way of thinking about it, is so critical is because he's fighting not just some people that if you killed them, the whole system would collapse, right? He's fighting the system of ideas that is ingrained in the minds of the, the the slave owners, their children, their grandchildren, their friends, the slaves themselves. Um, he, he has a moment in this, in the narrative where he talks about how slaves would often get their, their value from their slave owners. And so they like my slave owner has done this, right? Yours, your, yours isn't that good. And which is a really, you know, weird thing, but you can understand why that would happen though. And if you, you know, one of the hard things about literature is putting yourself in there and accepting the world, even if it's sometimes horrific. So if you can put yourself into the mind and the, the feelings of a slave in 1840 Maryland, you can understand why they have nothing else to, to latch on to. I mean, their families are broken up purposefully. That's part of what they do. They, they don't have family tradition. They don't have the tradition of where they came from in their country. They have nothing. So the only thing they can latch on to to get any kind of value, which is essential to existence as a human, is that they're masters, which is what their masters want. This is the, you know, quote unquote, horrific brilliance of this kind of system is that they, they do that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, what you're hitting at at a core level is like self-worth, that the master doesn't want you to feel any self-worth as a human being. And and at the end of the day, I think that's the rise out of slavery is the is the understanding and acceptance and pride of I am an individual human being. And and I think that's at the core of Douglas is saying even, even he can even speak. He's got this other letter to uh, it's called letter to a letter to my slaveholder or something like that that he mm. wrote to his slaveholder to, to his master after he was free. And you, you if you go out and read this, it's amazing because he speaks to that him crazy enough as a human being. He's trying to reach this man, but he says, you know what? If if you want to change around, I'll be the first one to open my door as a human being. But if not, get the f out of my way. Basically, is what he's saying. You know, so but only somebody with a pride in who they are as an individual can write such a letter. You know, so I I think you're right to emphasize the fact that, you know, this is about developing a person's individual self versus, oh, I'm I'm a part of this group where my master's really strong. I've got the strongest master. Your master's nothing because it's about others. It's about I'm a part of some group or so forth. And I think, you know, Douglas does a great job of contrasting the two here's an here's a human being that i rose up for myself versus when you're in that slave system as you said you've got nothing to live for so you got to latch on to something you know so yeah. it's sad and now I, I would like to move into like some of the, the things about like how he came out of this for himself particularly with a focus on reading and this is something that a lot of people who um, have written about this particular work, the narrative will focus on the reading that, that reading played a pivotal role. He says this himself that, you know, there's a moment like, um, I don't remember exactly what he says, but something like, you know, when I learned my ABCs and I heard my master say, don't teach that to the slave. That's when I realized that's the pathway. Like on some emotional level, he knew that because the master said, don't do this, this is a bad idea. This gave him the idea that this was a good idea for him. You know, what's what the master, basically the inversion of, he realized the inversion of the morality that he was living in. Everything that they said was good, was bad. Everything they said was bad, was good for him. Right. And yeah, that's, and I think, yeah, go ahead. You know, you're raising that scene. I think that's another, I mean, he says it explicitly, but that's a pivotal moment in his life when the, the kind hearted Mrs. Old 
starts to teach him his ABCs and she doesn't even th she doesn't think anything's wrong. Like, why would this be wrong to teach yeah. another human being? And the master, and the master's not even talking to Douglas. He's talking to his wife and he says, as you're basically saying, listen, you need to stop this right now because if you teach this child this, then there's no stopping him. And I think there's some line, cause I, I wrote a little piece on this, but he said something yeah. like, if you give that N word, you know, an inch, then he'll take a, a now, which is like a yard. So like you give a little bit, just a little taste of learning, of knowledge, of that kind of Socratic, wow, this this, this world is interesting. They're gonna run with it. And yeah. so I, I think it is it is huge that Douglas as a child overheard the master, the master yep. saying that and he goes, oh, there's something there. You know, there's something really there. So I, yeah, I think that's huge that you're raising this point because it's it's massive in his life. You well, know? can you tell us a little bit about that, that article? So this is, so you're, the, the article's about the reading uh, of him because he learns from Miss Ald to begin yeah. with, but she does stop teaching him. So yeah. he has to figure out ways to learn how to read now that he has the motivation. Yeah. Right. And as teachers, motivation is so critical to us. We want to get everyone motivated. And you can only imagine have someone as motivated as Frederick Douglass at this point. Like this guy would do anything. And yeah. so, I, you know, what maybe you could tell us a little yeah, bit more I mean, about your article. I got something fascinating with the article too, but I'll just tell you about it first. So I just wrote some article. Douglas has been a hero of mine for, I mean, years, if not a decade plus. And, you know, since I'm in Montessori education, since I really, forget even Montessori, just working with children, it's a really fascinating tale that Douglas tells because after Miss Old stops helping him because of the reasons we've talked about, you know, she starts to kind of be corrupted by this slavery and then the husband's kind of over, you know, looking over her back. Um, Douglas starts using his, he wants to read now. So he's going to, he's going to read no matter what. So he starts meeting up with these boys in the street and starts like basically trading them things so that they can teach him how to read. Mm -hmm. So it's just this, a wonderful thing of like him using his mind and thinking, how can I get these boys to teach me? Right. Yeah. So I wrote this piece about these boys that helped Douglas along the journey. And, you know, Douglas, I don't know what the exact quote is, but Douglas says something like, I never met a white uh, a white boy on the street that thought it was a good thing. Slavery was a good thing. Like there's, it's, I don't remember the exact words, mm -hmm. but children tend to like they're just happy go lucky, you know. Um, and he he was up north where you know, I imagine down south at this time even young children could be corrupted very early and could be very vicious to slaves. So I think this was because in the north, as Douglas talks about most people, it wasn't acceptable to be as vicious to your slaves as it was in the South. Um, well, I think, anyways, that's a, I think that's kids, a so I mean, just a, a point on that, like, cause I think that is a, an important thing that he points out. And there's, there's something, if you read Mark Twain, uh, adventures of Tom Sawyer, adventures of Huckleberry Finn, you know, Huckleberry Finn is a, is a big racist at the beginning, but part of it is he doesn't, he's from the, ru the rural South. It's what he's mm -hmm. been educated as. And the whole story is him coming out of that. That's the whole point yep. of it is him seeing um, the, the um, slave Jim, the escaped slave Jim as a human. Like it's, that's what the story I think is a fundamentally about. Yep. But I, I do think something about children is that um, I, I mean, you know, as educators, when you, and you saw them as a very young person or you're very young creatures, these little cute things, they don't, have impressions of like these kind of emotional exp impressions about the world. They approach in my experience, which is li more limited than yours. They approach mm -hmm. everything as like this wonderful new thing essentially. And yeah. so if they see, you know, uh, there's like a, a video on YouTube of like this little, very young, like one year old white kid and a one year old black kid. And they just running towards each other to hug. And I oh, think yeah. that is like the general nature of humanity toward new things at a very yeah. early, it's, the corrupting thing happens from parents and, you know, uh, and educators and church people or from TV or from other. And so it's comes from the outside that corrupts the yes. soul to hate a, a, another, especially when it comes to like a human, to hate a human. Yeah. Now a kid might be like, you know, but just to be clear, I think kids could be like, wow, why do you look like that? Right. There, there can be, because yeah. they're so honest and you've talked about this yeah. all the time. Yeah, like, that you have articles on this and, and go to Montessori education.com to read. Um, you have, your articles are there too, as well as Jesse M. Yeah. Yeah. There's some articles there. And, and yeah. yeah. And I think this is, you know, Maria Montessori talks about following the child. And I know sometimes today, because it's usually, it's like this traditional school versus super progressive. Yeah. About, 
when we say follow the child, we don't mean like, oh, everything the child does is brilliant and you should just like follow him off a cliff or something. Like it's <laughs> follow the nature of a child, which is that general curiosity I think you were talking about and that humanity. And so it's just like today people want to teach children to you know, not be racist or teach people want to teach children to be kind. It's like, no, no, they need to teach us to be kind. They need to, yeah. they're teaching us not to be racist. So it's, you know, I think we have the corrupting factor. We think, oh, we're going to come in and mold these, these children that can be difficult and, uh, and we're going to mold them into good people. Yeah. And it's like, Ugh. no, that's not how that's it works. Work. Yeah. You know? Um, so anyways, but but yeah, so Frederick Douglass was thoughtful and said, you know, I know these boys are going to, they don't care about my color. They just want, you know, they'll help out. So they were reading and, you know, they, Douglass learned from them. So uh, I think Douglass had a deep respect for humanity, including children. Um, and I just thought I'm going to hop on this and write something about the, the, the effect that children had on Douglass and how much he cared about them. Um, but an interesting side note is I got like, I got so much like people saying, wow, that's so nice. I, I, I didn't know about Douglas. I didn't know about this. And, and then like one or two people uh, reached out to me and said, you need to take this down. Mm -hmm. You need to take this article down. And I said, well, I was like, in sh like, why should I take this article down? And it was because I was uplifting white supremacy by talking about how children help Frederick Douglass to read. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Wait, but Douglas wrote this. He was happy to tell the world how children helped him. But and the response was, "That's okay for Douglas to say, but you can't say that because that you're trying to use his story to uplift white supremacy." Hmm. And it's just it's and it's wild when you hear these things. And I think of like Douglas is such a hero to my to me. Um, and I just I love the fact that when you see things where somebody comes and tries to attack something that, that I think is beautiful. I owe, I'm always open to these things, but you have to have an argument beyond that. I just feel this is the way it should be. And so I just tend to think back to with Douglas, he's always questioning things. He's always saying, well, why should I be a slave? Why mm -hmm. should I be the one down here? And he's not just accepting things. So I think when you when I get pushed back or I get feedback, I love people that push back. And I think it's some with Douglas. He loved to get in debates. He loved to get in discussions. He didn't care who what color you were. Like let's let's talk it out. But you have to have a reason. Mm -hmm. You can't just tell me, no, you get back to your where you belong, Douglas. Or because you're black, you should not be in here with us white people talking with us. You get go to the other room. You know, say like, why? Yeah. That just that simple childish question. Wait, why? So I just, there's something about Douglas that he just embodies curiosity as human, as a human being. Um, and not just like intellectual, let's just, that's, but then I'm going to do something about it, you yeah. know, which I love. So it's not just discussion for discussion's sake. It's discussion yep. for action's sake and it's how to take the best actions. Now there's, there's two things you, that I think are important for us to, to maybe uh, chat about here is the, that you just pointed out. One is the, um, what we can, what people of all ideologies today can learn from Frederick Douglass, which we've kind of pointed at already. But I think we do have certain movements going on, which are, you know, taking some parts of Frederick Douglass, I think, and, and kind of absconding with the others and kind of just cutting off the others. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like the 1619 Project, the BLM movement, not everybody, but certain ideas that they hold that, you know, for instance, the um, action over thought thing or, or they, they do action over thought sometimes where it's, let's just take action. Let's, 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 you know, um, rioting or, or, or looting can be a good thing because it's what we're owed. Violence is a good, because by the way, um, Frederick Douglass was pro violence. He was pro, you know, you take the cartridge box because, and again, I actually agree with him. Like I don't, I think if you are a slave owner, you don't have some kind of right to life. You have, you've moved into the realm of violence. And once you're in that realm, you're open to the violence that's open to you or, you know, that that's there. And so he, he meant it in the sense though, I think not of just like killing anybody who's, you know, at all there, but he, his sense was the, the violence he did against, um, like that overseer, like that's the kind of violence he means is, you know, you have a right to your life. Nobody has a right to tell you what to do. You can stand up for yourself and you need to stand up for yourself. And I sometimes worry that there's kind of only getting that, but not getting the thoughtful side. So the other point I wanted to make um, about this was, 
you you mentioned how he's very logical and he wants reasons. So in his he's very rhetorical. He's he's this grand orator. He's a famous orator. Um, and we talked about his beautiful, you know, biblical language and literary language. But it is very logical. He doesn't just have emotional language. It's also logical. There's also, like I said earlier, the transformation of a good person, who like the the Miss Ald, Mrs. Ald, who was a non-slave owner, never had a slave. She worked with her own industry. He says she always had done things for herself. She married a man. He had slaves, and then she became this demonic person, right? It's the trans. So, but there's a logic to it. It's not just emotional language. Ah, this is horrible. I don't know. And he, you know, it's like you're saying he, and he'll talk through any kind of argument. Um, I, now I could be wrong in this, but I, again, I was listening to a lecture on this by um, an individual by the name of Timothy Sandifer, uh, a VP of litigation at the Goldwater Institute. And he was, he's written a couple books on um, Frederick Douglass. And he mentioned something about how um, initially Frederick Douglass had a lot of reservations about the declaration and the, the bill of rights as an actual good document. But he slowly became convinced that it was a good document. It wasn't a slave document. Um, it was the only document possible to come out of slavery, to bring us out of, to bring the world into America out of slavery. Eventually, even though it failed from 1776 to 1865 in doing that. So um, anyway, so I, you know, yeah. things for you, maybe I don't know if you have any comments about, yeah. What we what people can learn today, the logic, you know, his methods um, from so Frederick Douglass. I think what you're getting at, which is fascinating, that you've kind of just organically come to it, is that Frederick Douglass is very hard to take as your man if you're a part of some movement that is like, ah, this is the way I'm going, because. Mm movements try to, you know, take on Frederick Douglass as their man. Like there were a lot of old school conservatives that, you know, Frederick Douglass was like their hero because he was a defender of, you know, the American, you know, the founding of America and founding documents. And they kind of just pushed away all the other stuff like you're talking about with like, like that, uh, what July 4th means to the slave and so forth. They didn't really reference that. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the quote far left or the liberal side, They'll take Frederick Douglass and the violent aspect of Frederick Douglass. It's like, we're not going to, we're not going to just, you know, sit in the restaurant and not, you know, fight back if somebody punches us, like kind of like Martin Luther King style, which was the pacifism of Martin Luther King. So the modern left, they'll take those elements of Frederick Douglass and be like, we need to act. And, you know, and, and it's funny that there, I think the reason is because Frederick Douglass didn't care about your movements. Mm -hmm. He cared about himself as an individual. What's my understanding of the world? And I want slavery to be done. Like it's inhuman. So he didn't need to mold to one or the other. He just needed to mold to what's true. So as you were kind of getting at, at some point, Frederick Douglass realized fully that America, the founding ideas of America are what will end slavery. The idea that all human beings are created equal or that are equal. And that is the way out in a way. But this idea that slaves should just, well, we'll fight our way out by talking about these things. No. If somebody's, got, if somebody's got a gun to my head and I can somehow get out of it by punching him in the face or shooting him myself with my own gun, oh, I'm going to take action. Mm -hmm. So what I think you're, again, what I think you're getting at is Douglas is a unique individual, independent individual. And I, I compare him in some ways to Maria Montessori because these, the big people in, in, in history, like a Socrates as well, they're individuals and they don't abide by your, mm -hmm. what your rules are for this group. Yeah. So nobody wants to really own Frederick Douglass. And in the modern kind of BLM movement and so forth, which I have friends that are, that consider themselves in the BLM movement and so, and they're really cool people. They're good people. But at the core, these people, the BLM movement does not take Frederick Douglass as their man because he's got, he has so much respect for the founding ideas of America minus slavery. Yeah. You know? So, and again, the conservatives can't take him on because he, yeah, he cares about America, but he's a little bit too radical for their taste in terms of, you know, the, the language and the violence of uh, getting out of slavery. So. Now, I think um, to kind of wrap up on a couple things is one, one thing I really wanted to hammer home and talk to you about, um, and don't forget to show us the book. I, I just remembered uh, there's a book you wanted to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll do that before we leave. So everyone stick around. There's a book. 
a very special book that Jesse's going to share with us. Um, not my book, it's Frederick not, Douglass. Not, yeah, Frederick Douglass's yeah. favorite book. So we'll save that till the end. But I wanted to focus a little bit and kind of ending on the importance of literacy and, and reading. And, and not just how he learned it, but why literacy was, particularly was so important. So one of the, I mean, just as on, on a personal note, that, that I've learned that I didn't really learn how to read until I was maybe in my 20s. And what I'm, you know, I, I read a quote from Mortimer Adler, who, who, uh, yeah, how to, what is that? Great books. What's his, how title? to read, a, how to read a book is, read is a book. yeah. The, the, the one that. he wrote in the forties and then again in the seventies, uh, they're both good, great books to read. Those books is life changing. He put together the great books of the Western world. He was one of the main editors of that, of that series, a famous series in the fifties. But he has this quote that we are of, um, a nation of functional literates, and we need. And essentially, he said we need to become a nation of competent literates, and I think that is critical. And it's something in learning about Frederick Douglass is, you know, um, what you were just saying about him becoming an individual. Part of becoming a competent reader and being able to read and not just put him into that one category that we all want him to be, and just. Oh, I'm going to ignore these things and not put the totality together. That's a skill, a, a holistic, you know, W-H-O-L, holistic, I guess, <laughs> of reading challenging books and, and the value of reading these really challenging pieces of literature, history, science, math, and all the, you know, and when you get older, philosophy. That is really a critical skill that we need to have as the uh, bar for all Americans. Like right now, the bar... And, and this is just a kind of lesson in reading from him, just the importance of becoming an individual. It's the only, I think it's one of the only ways to become an individual, is to become a competent reader. At least that's one lesson I got from the narrative. Is, um, and that needs to become a new bar. It's something that's inspiring me. And, and this book, you know, I'm uh, very passionate about it now. So again, thank you for putting it back into my life because I think it's a good example of becoming a functional literate, uh, literate is what a lot of us I think are, it's just a fact. And we could talk about, you know, it's maybe look at some of my other work, but my, just as an example, if you can't pick up Machiavelli or Herodotus or Shakespeare and get something out of it, then you're not quite at a competent reader level yet. And so that means there's a ton of stuff that you're not capable of getting out of it. And it is a skill that you need to get better at and everyone's capable of doing it, but you need training. Like I needed training. So Anyway, I just don't know if you have anything to add, you know, as a Montessori yeah. educator um, on the importance, because you've taught me, by the way, a lot about independence um, that I never thought of because of your experience with kids and Montessori. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy you raised this because it's it's a cha it's a challenging idea that you're raising because I when I first started teaching, it was all about content. Like I was an I was an engaging speaker. It was never was like a super boring class or something like that. But it was it was more focused on these kids need to learn X. Mm. They need to read this book. And although I think it's important as human beings that we are reading texts like Aristotle. Like if you if you haven't read some of Aristotle, I think that's like something all human beings should have some taste of. Mm. But I'm just very careful because I I'm particularly talking with younger children. And, and even thinking of myself, and I'd be curious with you how this happened. When I started to love reading, the reason was I found a book that I loved. It wasn't because I was reading some super challenging passage in Plato and it, and it inspired my intellect to really understand things. That wasn't my experience. Now, later, I love that challenge. I don't understand this piece. Like, what is he trying to say? Like, I want to get to it. But my initial thing was just like, I met a character, Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead, where I was like, I've never seen somebody like this. I've never seen some, and 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 I want to be more like that because some, there's some things I don't like about myself. And I was like, damn, I want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Not like I want to have orange hair or something like that. But it was like, no. there's some element, there's some aspect. Yeah, maybe I would. Yeah, if, but if, I'll if take I, some orange hair. But but in all seriousness, I, I'm just I'm gonna push back a little bit because I think there's a traditionalist view, and particularly among. Um, even colleges I like, like Hillsdale, I really admire what Hillsdale is doing. But there's there's a kind of like platonic view that we need to grapple with challenging texts. And yeah, I think it's good to have challenges in life in any field. But 
you know, I, I, I would take a farmer who just reads for fun, but kicks ass on his farm and is just enjoying life. I take him any day over some academic sitting up in his, in his castle at a university who does nothing in the real world and is just going to dissect Plato and tell us how profound it is. So I'm just yeah. raising this as I don't like, I don't like people saying to hell with reading, let's get into the real world. And I don't like people that get crazed about, we need to have this intellect. And then the real world, they've got no practicality. So I think you need well, to have do, an Do you think that's what I was saying though? No, 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 no. But I'm just raising it as because, um, no, I, I think, I mean, I think what you're doing is awesome. And I think it's a slant like you, you're, this is, this is something that excites you. And I think it, but I, I just be careful of, there could be a whole podcast on like, you know, how to farm or how to code. And, and that person, I think we, I think you and I probably agree that every human being should have a basic understanding of some of these texts that are, are meaningful for humankind. But I would just, I'm just more careful against like, everybody has to read these, these exact books and understand this exact thing. Hmm. Um, or else, but, but no, I'm not saying you're saying that, but I'm just putting out there as a warning for either side, like to hell with books or we need to get the challenge, you know? Hmm. Uh, so, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's an interesting conversation that probably would take a couple hours to go into. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I see what you're saying. It's, and I definitely would agree with the idea that it has to be a particular bunch of groups. I think there's options um, and I definitely like the teaching kids to, to in, you know, how to help them fall in love with reading. And I think there's a variety of ways to do that. I, do, I guess the, where my pushback would come from was that I don't think it has to be with um, what sometimes I see as bringing it down to their level versus, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't think there's anything. I don't think kids should get, grapple with philosophy, by the way, at all. So I don't think that's a question. But I don't think why there's any reason why they can't read, you know, obviously not five-year-olds, but at a certain age within K through 12, why they can't read Homer as, you know, in a good translation of the actual Homeric prose, yeah. right? And actually getting good, you know, that, or or even reading sections of Herodotus and Thucydides and, and you know, in a, as a yeah. young kid for history. Now, I think that you can't just give them, you know, if you're trying to teach them Roman history, you can't just throw Plutarch at them and say, figure it out, <laughs> you know, like, and, and you, you, there needs to be, um, other texts there. And this is where the teacher comes in. But I think like in history and literature, they need to be reading. My view is they need to be reading earlier, more original texts. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's all I mean. And because reading as a systematic approach to things needs to be a skill that's developed that, it's to me, it's an, it's absolutely absurd that people I've talked to that are getting masters and PhD still don't know how to read. They don't, they're, they're yeah. not at the analytic level of, or, or syntopical level of reading. It's like, you're getting a PhD, like you're getting a masters you're, and you can't, you, can, you can't get anything out of Milton. Like, I don't understand what you're doing with yeah. your life. Like that's 20 years of education. So my point is that I, so I agree with you. There has to be a mixture though, is my view where you, you're having them fall in love with the stories but if they don't fall in love with the challenging of the, the, the text itself, I don't know that they, that you can rely on them to ever do that on a regular basis. And I guess the last thing I'll say is, and this is something with, with Frederick Douglass's approach to the importance of what, you know, he, he wrote as how to make a, you know, something of yourself and how to get out of slavery, how to become an independent man. He said this somewhere else is four things, work, 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 work. And I do think, um, you know, with one exclamation for the first one, two, three, and four, like, so mm -hmm. he really meant it. Like work is what you have to do. And, you know, there is a value where it's like in order for, this is my transition in reading lots of classic literature, lots of difficult, uh, poems is that you, no one will ever enjoy that process if they're not shown that process. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think most people are going to make that leap on their own. And if someone goes through K through 12 and they don't get that fullness of uh, education where they get, where they're in a sense almost forced to do it, or at least it's part of their assignment, they're never going to do it unless they're the rare person like me that dedicates my life to it. Um, so I think, and then I think that's a big part of what's going to be missing in their life. 
uh, even yeah, if so, they stop after K through 12 and they don't do it regularly or some chunk of them don't, but I don't think that's going to yeah, so happen I, either. So anyway. I, I mean, you're, you, again, you're, I think you have a good slant from, from my perspective. And I think what you're fighting against is the dumbing down of America and, and, and a dumbing down of human beings. And what all I would say is that the way to solve that is not for a dumbed down teacher to start introducing Homer to children because the way to do <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. the way to do it is for teachers to actually love Homer themselves. Yes. And that's the only way it, to do it. It's so it's yeah. modeling. I think of like Atticus in this, in this sense, like yeah. Attic, he's my, he's an From ideal to kill dad. A mockingbird, by the way, everybody. Yeah. He, he's an ideal dad because he's living it and yeah. his child is going to look at and say, I want to be like dad. But if you imagine you go to some you know, normal school, whether it's private school, traditional school, and they're like, you need to read this because it's deep and we need to think deeply. And they're just blabbering in your ear as a child. It's like, shut up. I'm going to go play. Yeah. So, but if, man, if Kirk, you and I are like, in, when we're on our off time, we're reading some powerful like Beowulf or whatever the heck excites you. And a child, you know, I remember this one kid I had brought in, we were, we were learning about um, ancient Islam and I had brought in just the confessions you know, early mm -hmm. on pre-Islam to show them about St. Augustine and so forth. And I had it up and I was like, I just brought it in to show them how thick it is, how big it is. And this one child comes up, he's in six weeks. He's like, I'm going to read that. And mm. I thought, I mean, I wasn't <laughs> saying I like the confessions. I was just saying, I've read this book. It's cha it's a challenging book, but it, it played a lot into what we learned. I wasn't expecting a sixth grader to be like, uh, but he took on the challenge. Yeah. So uh, all I'm getting at, and I think, Kirk, if you were a Montessori person up here going, just let the child be free. Don't talk about any particular books. It's let him choose. And I would be pushing back the other way and go, get some real literature in your classroom. Get yeah. some meaningful classical text and see maybe a child will pick that up. Yeah. So I'm just kind of pushing back on both ends, but I, I'm with you. I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this is one of the nice, why I hope there's more schools, more Montessori education. You know, I, I think we're in a new world and we, you know, this is one of the motivations for why I'm doing these podcasts and we can kind of, wrap up here. And, you know, if you have any concluding remarks, um, you know, I'm doing, I just launched the literary canon club, the whole motivation or the, the thing I've been wanting to do that for a long time, but the, the catalyst for me was the disrupt texts movement. And mm -hmm. although that's been around for decades to some degree, I mean, it's really big. When I saw them not just say, Oh, by the way, we got Homer off the curriculum, which I saw as one of their main things where we got Shakespeare, but that they were celebrated by thousands of teachers celebrated. And this is, so this is the achievement we're now doing is to get off of the curriculum, these texts. And so the Literary Canon Club, um, and by the way, if you're interested, go to troubadourmag.com and you'll see Literary Canon Club at the top. Um, go check that out. But it's basically what you're saying. And I agree 100%. Um, you have to be, you have to read them for yourself and enjoy them as works of imaginative fiction and literature as great stories if you're ever going to teach them. So part of what I hope people like the whole point of the club is to come to the club and read the texts, just read them as they are, you know, from the Iliad down to Gatsby and, you know, um, up to Rand, even if you, if you uh, want. So a lot of texts that we read, um, that we, that we encourage people to read and help people read. And for me, I hope that that's one way that parents will pass it on to their kids, that homeschool parents will be reading Beowulf or, um, you know, what is it? Christian Yvonne, the night of the, the night of the, the uh, lion, which I really like is a, mm. a classic okay. medieval text that people don't read is wonderful. Christian Detroit. It's one of the first Arthurian tales, you know, things like that, that you start reading that and then your kids will want to read it. And like you said, so yeah. that's my motivation. I'll let you have the last word and then we'll, we'll say goodbye to everybody. But, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'll just wrap up. I wanted to say, I, I'm not even a fan of Beowulf. So I, I'm a more <laughs> epic, of Gilgamesh, epic of Gilgamesh kind of guy. So if you, okay. if you read that one, go oh, yeah, for it. That. But um, so I'll just wrap up by saying, I think, you know, Alexander the Great had the Iliad under his pillow or supposedly had it. I don't even know if they had pillows back then. So I don't know how le legitimate it is, but supposedly no, they he had, had a, straw or something in a, in a sack. <laughs> I mean, he's not sleeping he had, on stone. He had the Iliad and a knife under his sack then. Okay, so, <laughs> and then uh, yeah. And then there's uh, Frederick Douglass I read. And, yeah. you know, he as a young child had um, the Columbian Orator. So I had I found this like original from back oh, in the wow. day. So I just think to myself. Frederick Douglass might have held this or something like that. It's just, it's kind of spiritual. The and cool Columbia, wait, hold on. The Columbian, the Columbian or order. 
Yeah. What is that? And basically what it is, is, and ironically enough, I'm sure it's a, it's a collection of poems and, and lectures and talks that he found inspirational and kind of helped him to read and to become a great orator. Mm. Um, I imagine half of these would be canceled today that, that he loved, you know? Um, and the only thing I would end with is that I think is we need to be careful as a culture, because I think when we, we think about what's going on out there in the world, like, the, like the crazy cancel culture where they're canceling books and so forth, or the far, far other side, that's like doing like, they're just serious racists that want this country to be like all white. It's such a sliver of us human beings, such a sliver. It's like this, it's like a t my uh, junior high teacher used to say, it's the 10% slime. Mm. So I just want, I want to really be careful in thinking, our, it might not be our quote culture. It might be a 10% slime that's just getting on our shirts. Mm. And we need to say, to hell with this. And don't even, I don't pay them any attention. I do things like we're doing today and talking in a very honest, open way and having discussions. Um, and to hell with both of those sides. It, that's my perspective. Um, and and let's read people like Frederick Douglass. Yep. You know, and let's let's hear the perspective of people that actually lived the lived the life and did the deeds um, and enjoy them and then have these conversations. So thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And it's a uh, it's always good to chat. So no, that was a wonderful sentiment. So go visit Jesse McCarthy. Um, you can go to MontessoriEducation.com to see his work. So. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, everybody, for <laughs> for she listening said, to us. And she said goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> your, your dog said goodbye too, and maybe I'll bring my dog. No, um, and everybody, thank you. Go read the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass.